everybody. I'm Jean Chatsky, and welcome back to Your Money Map, a show sponsored by the Alliance for Lifetime Income. And a very special thanks to our presenting partner for this episode, Prudential Financial, a proud member of the Alliance. So we all know about the gender pay gap. We've been hearing about that for years, but many people don't realize that this difference between the amount of money men earn and the amount of money women earn contributes to a retirement income gap between men and women. Lower incomes, longer lifespans, and and a tendency among some of us, myself included, sometimes to avoid risk in the markets are just a few of the challenges that women are likely to face, causing them, causing us to have less in savings for retirement, which then needs to last us more years because, of course, we tend to outlive the men in our lives, at least uh, at least by the averages. We are going to walk through all of this today. We're going to do it with a couple of fantastic guests. And just to set the table before I bring them in, um, let me remind all of you that we really like this to be an interactive conversation. And so if you've got questions, if you've got comments, whether you're watching on Facebook or LinkedIn, type them in, send them my way. I'd be very, very pleased to weave them into the conversation. All right, so here we go. Here's what we know about the differences between how men and women are set up for retirement. On average, women have about 70 thousand dollars less in retirement savings than men. That's according to research from Bank of America. Women are also more likely than men to report that they have absolutely no retirement savings at all. That's Census Bureau research. And as I said, this retirement income gap, it's due in very large part to the gender wage gap. Women are still paid an average of 82 cents for every dollar that men make, black and brown women make significantly less. That adds up over a lifetime. Research from the National Women's Law Center found that a 40-year-old woman starting full-time work today will amass $400,000 less over a 40-year career compared to a man who is starting in the exact same position. So the question is, how does this make us feel? Well, it makes us feel worried. It makes us feel stressed out. Research done by the Alliance for Lifetime Income and Her Money found that three out of five women worry about our finances several times every single month. The research also showed that 73% of women know what steps to take to build a nest egg, but less than half know how to make that money last during retirement. Today, we are going to focus on solving that problem. And as I said, we're going to do it with two incredible women. My guests today are Kathleen Burns Kingsbury. She is a financial therapist and author and coach. And Melissa Kivett, Head of Enterprise Strategic Relationship Management at Prudential Financial. Let me just welcome both of you to the conversation. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Kathleen. We're gonna we're gonna move us ourselves around and and let me just take a second and, and tell everybody just a little bit more about you. Um, Kathleen today is coming to us uh, from Vermont, where, as I said, she is a financial therapist. She's also a nationally recognized speaker and the author of four books on money. And she's got a wonderful podcast, Breaking Money Silence, which empowers women to talk about their finances. Hi, Kathleen. Hello, Jean. How are you today? Doing really, really well because it's beautiful here. Uh, Melissa Kivett, as I said, is head of the Enterprise Strategic Relationship Management at Prudential Financial. She works to forge and strengthen relationships with the company's businesses and its power partners. And she's also a founding member of the Alliance for Lifetime Income. Welcome, Melissa, and thank you for all of that. Thanks, Jean. Great to be here. 
So, so I laid out some pretty devastating statistics at the top of the show, statistics that I know you've heard before, either these exact ones or, or similar ones, um, because you are both in the trenches with real women every single day. Melissa, let me, let me start with you. What are you seeing and what is most worrisome to you when it comes to women in retirement? Yeah, I think there is a lot to be worried about. Um, you mentioned, you know, all the things, the pay, the pay gap, the income gap, the gap um, that women have and in just investing and in the confidence to take the steps they need to retire. I think what probably worries me the most is if women believe that it's too late, um, that they have fear and that almost like, you know, when I talk to my mom about her retirement, she said, I don't even want to look at the numbers. Um, I don't really think this is possible because I do think that there is a lot of hope um, that this is solvable. Um, there are solutions that um, women don't know about that can, as you say, protect their income, get a paycheck for the rest of their life. There are policy changes that have made it easier and uh, better for women and men um, to save in retirement. And there are small things that we all can do um, to actually make, make a difference. So I'm optimistic um, about, um, even though I'm worried, I'm optimistic about the things that we can do. And I just want, I probably most important to me is just giving women the confidence that they can do this, that there is things that they can do uh, to make it better. Yeah, I I, um, I agree with you. And I, I also want to let anybody watching know that this conversation is going to be solutions focused. So so we're going to talk about the things that you can do to, to gain that confidence and also to improve your financial life while we know you're worrying. We're already hearing from the crowd. Coco says, it's true. I worry several times a day. Kathleen, is that what you're hearing from the women that you work with? I am, Jean, and I agree with what Melissa had to say, that we're up against a lot, but what I love about women in general is their spirit, and so we are very resilient, and I think if you're able to think about the solutions and think about the small steps you can take to make a difference in your own life and not let your emotions overwhelm you, which is easier said than done, then you are able to move forward towards uh, making sure that your retirement is uh, right for you. And so we also need to appreciate that, you know, different people need a different type of uh, retirement amount or a lifestyle. Um, so there's some individual pieces too, but I, I'm glad we're talking about solutions and, and really being solution focused today, because I think we can solve this problem. You, you live in the world of emotions, Kathleen. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, you know, that's that's sort of your your sandbox. Why is it that issues like retirement specifically and money in general are so emotional? Boy, that is a big question. I, I think that money is really emotional because we have this money silence in our society where a large number, one study was almost half of us, don't talk openly and honestly about money. And when you look at women, I think there's a double whammy. Uh, the numbers for women is up to about 61% of women would rather talk about their own death than talk about money with other people. And you know, when we don't talk and when we don't share about money, we make up all these stories about how everybody else is doing it differently and we're the only ones that have these mixed feelings about money. Um, so I think the more we can have conversations like we're having today and the more people can recognize that it's okay to be emotionally about, emotional about money, that in itself isn't wrong, but it's using that, your emotions as data to really think about, okay, if I'm feeling this way, you know, feel your feelings, but what are some of the action steps that I can take? And, and are these valid feelings or, or is this something that over time I can solve by you know, maybe consulting with somebody else or talking about money or getting a financial plan. We've been talking now for almost 10 minutes, and I think I've probably said the word retirement maybe 30 times. Um, there's a question about the word retirement okay. and, and whether it's the right word anymore. When, when you're hearing from women, Melissa, and you're talking to women, and I know um, at Prudential you do a lot of research, do you find women think about this differently than men? Are are we are we um, are we asking for a different word? 
I think it, we've redefined what retirement means, uh, what the word means. Um, I don't know that we've come up with a better word, but I think it's redefining what life looks like. And for many people, that means continuing to work or work in a different way. And, uh, but it's also the freedom to live the, a life that they want. And that maybe is different than what retirement was for our grandparents or different generations. Um, if you're watching and you're listening, um, please let us know what retirement means to you. I'd be very interested to, to hear from the crowd. I know, Kathleen, you spoke to a number of women and you asked them, um, you know, should we should we call it something else? What did, what did they what did they tell you? And what do you think the the um, the blockers are around the concept? Let me start with the blockers. I think that when we think about retirement in the traditional sense, we think like this is the end of our life. And so people don't necessarily want to focus on the phase of life that is the end of their life. And yes, it is a part where we are going into the third phase of life. But as Melissa said, we've certainly redefined that. So when I talk to clients about retirement or this next phase of their life, I usually ask them what word would they like to use? And a lot of women use words like freedom, it's my time, um, I'm inspired to start a, you know, my own business, that they're not thinking of it in the sense of, I'm gonna sit around and, and not do much. They're thinking, finally, after taking care of the kids or taking care of my elderly parents, or you know, really putting my needs uh, you know, behind some of the other folks in my family, that it's gonna be a time for me. And I think if we allow our clients and the, the women out there to define it and come up with a vision for themselves, they're going to be much more excited to then save for that vision as opposed to saving for this thing called retirement that that feels somewhat outdated. Can, can you can you give me an example of what that might look like? Sure, I'll give you a, a real life example from a, a client I worked with. Uh, I said to her, I said, you know, we were talking about saving for the future and she was very resistant with her money personality uh, to save for the future. And I said, well, what, what is it? She goes, every time I go into the financial advisor, they tell me I need to save for retirement. And I know intellectually I need to save for retirement. She goes, but that just demotivates me. I just don't wanna do that. I said, well, what would retirement look like for you? Like what would this phase of life, like when you become 60, 70, 80? And she goes, I just want to skydive and I want to continue to have fun. And I said, you want to skydive? And she said, yes. And I said, okay. I said, what if instead of retirement, it was a skydiving fund and you just fund it so you could be physically, emotionally, uh, nutritionally, you know, prepared to be able to skydive through your 80s. And she goes, that would be more exciting for me. So that's how she redefined it. So it may not be as extreme for the folks out there uh, as a skydiving fund, but really thinking about something that's going to resonate with you and, and what's going to motivate you um, to do the work that you need to do to take care of yourself through your entire life. I, I think we know from behavioral finance that when you make a goal visual, right? Yep. When you give it a when you give it a name, when it's no longer just your vacation fund, but it's two weeks in Maui fund, yep. Yep. then you have a better shot at actually putting the money away for that goal. So that that makes sense to me. What what I think is really interesting though about that example is is Melissa, you did some research at Prudential that that showed that more than two thirds of women believe they are misunderstood by their own financial advisors, which says to me that this sort of scenario, skydiver or not, and I am in the not category, um, that this sort of scenario probably happens all the time. Absolutely. I'm in the not category too. Um, but yes, I, women want to be heard and they feel that their advisors don't hear them, that they do misunderstand them. And yet so over 71% of women said that they would be interested in working with an advisor. So I think there's hope for advisors if advisors can demonstrate that they can listen and understand that the needs of women are different. And, you know, I think the best fact that shows that um, how this works, if you don't listen, if, if you're not attuned to the needs of the women, we know that over 71% of women actually fire their spouse's advisor uh, if, if their spouse dies. So we know it's real, but then we also know that 
women do want help um, and you just need to be able to change that conversation, show empathy be, um, to the needs of, of women. And as Kathleen said, these, can, these need to be personalized. People have different visions of what retirement um, or that next phase of their life can look like. How do we get advisors to rep to understand that women represent an underserved market opportunity? I mean, right now, despite all of those statistics, and again, some of them are quite grim, women control 51% of the wealth in the United States. Um, I have a male financial advisor, um, and I don't feel underserved by him because he is exactly what you said. He's empathetic. Mm -hmm. I feel listened to, right? If I didn't, I would walk. When you're giving, if you're, if you're, if you, if you were giving advice on how to connect, what would you say? Kathleen, you may know this more from a. I have spent 15 years with this, uh, with this question, but Melissa chime in and then I certainly can give my two cents worth. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think um, I think it's just recognizing that the needs are different. I mean, I think what's interesting more broadly about advisors is one of the things that we learned through the research of the Alliance for Lifetime Income is that advisors don't think that their customers want protected income um, in their retirement. And yet the vast majority of both male and female customers do. So there's a real disconnect between the advisor's understanding of what the needs are and what um, customers want. Kathleen, let me pass it to you to explain why. Well, I think that what's what's positive is there's a huge business case, right? That there is, uh, if we better serve women, the industry could make seven hundred billion dollars a year more. So it's clear that there's a business case, and women have more power, economic power, than they've ever had before. I think the disconnect, I'd like to say, isn't across the entire industry. I think we are getting somewhere. Uh, but I do think that we really need to focus much more on the emotional intelligence piece, the human side of finance, and really understanding not only just key gender differences, but, but key differences in humans in themselves. Like there's race, there's ethnicity, there's religious differences, the sexual orientation differences. And so there's all these pieces that make our clients so complex. Now that can be overwhelming, but if we customize and we really train advisors not to just have a cookie cutter approach, but to meet that female client or whoever it is or her partner right where she lives and really ask curious questions and get to know her, that is going to be a better approach than what's been done in the past. And it's not an easy problem to solve. But I think the other motivator out there is that the next generation, no matter how they identify in terms of their gender, do want these types of personalized services that are based more on behavioral finance, uh, the human side of finance. And of course, the technical side of finance is still important. But clients tend to live with their emotions, with their feelings, and with their real life issues, not necessarily uh, with the products and services that ultimately help them out. And, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kathleen, but I think that the next generation is more willing to walk if they feel that they're not being served. I think that they are accustomed to a greater level of service than uh, um, older people. I think so. I also think they're much more educated consumers. And I think that uh, the upside is uh, people are learning more about money and there's a lot of these online resources, programs like yours, uh, communities. And so they're much more informed and much more discerning and I do see a wave of the next generation of advisors doing a really great job to meet clients where they're at. So I am very optimistic about that. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Melissa, I want to go back to something that you brought up um, a few minutes ago, which is this concept of protection and the gap between the fact that consumers, primarily women consumers, but men as well, want it and they are not necessarily being offered it. What is it about protected income that is so appealing? Well, if you think about people who have pensions, they are very happy people. They're not worried about the ups and downs of the market. The problem is that pensions are less than 20, I think less than 24% 
of people have access to pensions today. So we need um, as a society to think about how do we actually find a way to have a, have a pension-like um, solution, a paycheck for the rest of our life. And so if, if we can identify these solutions, and, and that's what annuities basically are, is we know that not only are people happier, but you can actually spend more. And as you mentioned at the top of the show, we don't know how long we're going to live, but we know that women on average live a lot longer on average. I think it's like 87 years now. And that means half of us are going to live longer than 87 years. And so to take the risk out of like trying to figure out how long do I have to live? How long does my money have to last? That's what um, protected income solutions can provide is that peace of mind and not in taking that risk away so that you do have the freedom to live your own life. And so I think the real opportunity is for advisors to help I, um, figure out how these fit into people's portfolios. But if you don't have an if you don't have a financial advisor, if you're working at a company, another option is also just um, to contribute through your 401k. We now, with the passage of Secure uh, 2.0, we now have policies that allow people to make um, contributions through their employer plan employer plans, so that they can protect not only invest but protect their income. Melissa said that uh, that people who have pensions are very happy people. Um, Kathleen, I, I I mean I I actually agree with that. I have I have a couple of small pensions. Social security is a pension, right? That everybody has and should be focusing on maximizing, but it's not enough to live on. It was only meant ever to cover forty percent. What is it about this concept of protection that makes us feel better? Well, I think if we're talking specifically about women, we're talking about, in general, a group that tends to take less risk, have more money in savings, and just is more conservative. Now, that's a huge generalization, but um, when we think about protected income, it's also, in some ways, a conservative, uh, conservative structure. So, in other words, you know, having something guaranteed, having something secured, knowing and being able to lean on something, is really, really, I think, helpful for a lot of us. And to be able to have advisors who are educating us, to be able to have um, that psychological sense that I'm not going to run out of money. I mean, one of the biggest fears that women have, and I think it showed in your research too, but in other research, is running out of money and being a burden to their kids. So the idea that if I had protected income and I knew I wasn't going to run out of money and I knew I wasn't going to be a burden to my kids in my elder years, that's going to go a long way and just someone to be able to go and breathe. There's not many people that would say, oh, I don't you know, want guaranteed income. I'd rather take a huge risk. There are out, they're out there, but uh, <laughs> they're not in the general public, uh, so to speak, or in the, uh, the group that we're talking about right now. You know, it's interesting that you, you bring up the point about people um, not wanting to be a burden on their kids. Yesterday, President Biden signed an executive order to increase access to high quality care and to support caregivers. Where, where does child care and, and caregiving fit into this whole puzzle? I, I know, Melissa, that you focused on the, the impact that COVID um, had, and, and we really saw COVID take a toll on the caregivers. Yeah, women tend to be the caregivers in the household. Of the 40 million people that are providing full-time care to a family member, 58% of them are women. So it has a huge impact on women. And I think steps that uh, policies that we can take to help um, women like catch up, make catch up contributions um, as caregivers are things that are being discussed now that would really help things that would also help, you know, women are um, providing more economic security for them to actually remain in the workforce. Because as you said, they're the ones that are leaving the workforce to take care, like in COVID, take care of their kids, take care of their parents. Um, so anything that we can do to help support them, because when you leave the workforce, then you, the gap widens. The amount of money that you saved, the amount of money that you've earned um, just grows. And so any policies that we can do to support and help them, as you said earlier, catch, help women catch up um, would really help. I also think elder care, I'm sorry to jump in, but on the, no, other, on the other side of the spectrum is, and I've recently had a personal experience with this, um, just watching um, the elder care system not work and the time and energy it takes 
um, you know, for men and women, but it often, like we said, will fall to the female partner to be able to have to research and advocate and be there and care give and crisis, um, you know, triage in a crisis really only also emotionally takes a toll on you. But it was only recently that I realized, wow, financially, it can really take a toll on someone. Um, so I think if we could have, you know, and this is a lofty goal, but better elder care and better policies in our firms around just maternity leave and being able to really support the idea that um, just because someone's out of the workforce for a period of time caregiving, it doesn't mean they're not working and it doesn't mean they're not contributing to our society. Totally, totally agree. The folks at AARP did some research and, and found that in addition to all the time they're putting in, the people who are caregivers are coming out of pocket $7,000 a year on average for the, the person that they are caring for. So it's, it's a, it is a, a big sum of money. We promised solutions at, at, or at least some tactical advice at the top of this show. I want to, I want to turn to that. Um, we've got five steps, um, uh, Kathleen, that we've laid out, you've laid out to, to help, um, to help women really uh, take back control um, take some steps forward and and start putting a plan in place to know that um, that the retirement that you're looking forward to is is going to be as good as absolutely possible. The the first is is don't put fear in the driver's seat. Um, you you say that it's important to understand the underlying cause of concerns of your concerns and take appropriate action. Sounds easier said than done. <laughs> yes, and that's where sometimes financial therapy comes in. Sometimes working with a, a very uh, good financial advisor will be helpful. But basically, what I mean by that is, you know, you can feel fearful about retirement and and what's going on, and that fear can paralyze you. What's important to realize is, is that fear rational? Meaning, is it because you are behind and you haven't saved enough? And if so, then you need to get into action. Or is it something that may be not based on rationality? It may be that you um, do have enough resources, but for some reason you're just feeling paralyzed in moving forward or talking about money or talking about this next phase of your life. So figuring that first piece out is really, really key. Melissa, for me, I know sometimes when I'm feeling fearful, I actually force myself to do a data check. I force myself to go back and look at my numbers. And, and that helps because often the picture is not as bad as I'm catastrophizing it out to be. Yeah. And I think, you know, we should remind ourselves that women are often the CFOs of their households. They're running the households. They should not be afraid. They're actually more powerful and more and have more knowledge around the budget, what they're spending, what the, what the plans are. And so I think to me, it, it's, it's a great opportunity for women to, as Kathleen, you're saying, take the fair and use that as a motivator to actually think differently and re remind themselves and have confidence that they actually can do this. Yeah. In, in fact, your research at Prudential showed, I, I think it's 96% of financial decisions are being made either primarily or jointly with women. I mean, that's just astonishing. So powerful. Um, number two, Kathleen, you say, don't go it alone, get support. So we've been talking about financial advisors and I'll, I'll turn to Melissa to, to talk to how to about how to find one, but tell us about financial therapy and, and when is mm -hmm. that appropriate? So financial therapy is, is basically looking at your emotions uh, as they relate to money, how you think and feel and how that affects your behaviors. Now, often working, and I'm a big proponent of working with a financial planner or financial advisor, uh, but often if you're feeling stuck, if you're working with an advisor and you're not being able to make behavioral change around saving or around learning more about what you need to learn in order to save effectively for retirement, or if you're feeling so incredibly anxious that it's really getting in the way um, of your quality of life, that's often where financial therapy will come in. Uh, I'll work with someone around, okay, we're, you know, what, what is the angst around money? What is your money story in terms of what's your history around money? What are the messages or story you're telling yourself? And then how do you change your thoughts and, 
and beliefs around money and around the purpose of money in your life in order to feel more at ease. Um, financial therapy isn't a fix all for all problems, but it certainly can help you make some really important uh, mind shifts in terms of your relationship with money, as well as uh, changing your actual financial habits. And, and how do you find a financial therapist? Probably the best way is to go to Financial Therapy Association, you have to spell it all out, uh, .org. Uh, it's an association that's been around probably about 15 years. I am a member and they have different uh, financial therapy referrals in uh, different geographic areas. Uh, and certainly someone can always contact me and I know a lot of people in the industry. So if I'm not a good fit, somebody else might be. Uh, Melissa, to you, if it's, a, if it's a financial advisor, a financial professional that we're looking for, how, I, I get asked this all the time, what are your best tips for finding a fit? A fit, definitely, I think, talk to your friends and family to understand if they have a connection. The referrals um, are great. I mean, you can find them through company websites um, and online as well. And then I think also in your employer, um, financial advisors partner often with companies and hold seminars. And so that could be like a low risk setting to go in with a group of people and listen to an advisor and listen to um, the options and see if there's a fit or if you feel a connection with, um, with what they're saying and the options that they're kind of laying out. Kathleen, your third action item is to take one small action each week. And, and I love this because it's hard to do big things. Well, it's overwhelming. And also if we think about you know retirement, we, it seems so big. But if you say, okay, each week I'm gonna take one small step and guess what? You get to decide what that step is and it needs to be small and doable. Research shows if you pick something small and doable and then you're able to achieve it, that little success is gonna help you build and build and build, and ultimately you're gonna to get to your goal. Now, in this case, what is one small step? It could be you go, well, you know what? I need to know more about this protective income thing. You know, this week I'm going to Google and find out a little bit more, find out an article on it, or read the article that I think is gonna be attached to this replay. Um, or it could be, I'm gonna to go to Her Money and just sign up for that uh, community. It, it could be, I'm going to talk to a friend about money and see what they think about retirement. So it's small, it's doable. I would say something that takes you no more than 30 minutes. And then when you're able to accomplish it, celebrate it. And then the next week you pick something else that just moves the needle forward. That is how we change our behaviors. And that's how we achieve success. We often just don't realize that we do it little steps at a time. My analogy to that is like weight loss for me. It's like, it feels like un, insurmountable at times. Like, how am I going to lose the weight? It just t takes too long or takes too many steps. But if you do one little thing, to your point, Kathleen, you can make a big difference. And to me, the financial tip that I would say that people should consider that is pretty simple to think about is also is just about social security. A lot of people take their social security too early. Women often are younger are younger when their spouse retires and they take the social security with them. But just delaying it one year will add more money to, in your pocket. And if you can delay your social security, I think, you know, to, I think it's around the age of 70, um, you can increase your income by almost um, 25%, 24%. So again, small things, and if you can do it, they, they can make have a big financial impact. Yeah, it, it, that's a that's a huge one, actually, um, because by waiting, you get a return that is guaranteed. Right. You're going to get a bump in your monthly benefits. It's guaranteed. It is very difficult to beat that return in a guaranteed way pretty much any other way. So, yes, be careful with when you take your Social Security. Um, you suggest working with a gender savvy financial advisor, Kathleen, what, what define please? Sure. I think someone who's gender savvy um, understands that women have unique needs, has probably done some training on gender intelligence, understanding the differences between, um, you know, what the research says about how women connect with money and how versus men and how they think and feel and is able to uh, be emotionally intelligent. I, th I think the best way to tell for yourself 
is when you meet with an advisor, meet with a couple of them and trust your gut. One of the things I think women are really good at is having a good intuition. And, you know, it may take a meeting or two, but if it doesn't feel like a fit, it's okay. There are lots of other people out there. The other thing I would say is network. There are a lot of people who are uh, in the industry who are identifying as really good with women in transition or really good at working with millennial women or female breadwinners. You know, look for um, different people that you can network and get yourself in with an advisor like that. Melissa, I know that um, to uh, to your frustration and mine, um, many financial advisors these days, the lion's share of financial advisors these days are men. Um, at despite the industry's uh, effort to recruit and and train women, um, do you see that shifting? And and what do you think it'll take? I think that it doesn't have to be a female advisor. I think to Kathleen's point, I think that if men can understand the differences and the needs of women, I think it. it I think it already is shifting. I mean, we see an incredible amount of men advisors at Prudential signing up um, for um, our training, share, sharing our research and knowledge about the unique needs of women and leveraging that to have different conversations with their with their clients. So I think, yes, it's always great to see someone like you um, to sit when you're sitting down around the table, but like your financial advisors, I, I think a man can do it as, as long as they understand that the needs are different and that, you know, we've, uh, you know, our financial path is also different and we're living longer. So um, I'm optimistic, I think it's changing. And I think that, you know, everything that I'm seeing is that people, you know, just the idea of personalization, just understanding that the needs of people are different and that's changing across our whole industry. That's that's fantastic to hear and, and really good to hear about the the different training that, that um, your advisors are going through as well. Um, the last, last suggestion is to change your retirement money story for the next generation. Your money, your money story, as far as I understand it, Kathleen, is, is something that, that is with you from childhood right? It's, it's, it has to do with the way that you were raised, that, that not what you were taught necessarily, but the feelings about money that you absorbed in your home of origin. How do you change it for the next generation? So you are right. A money story is a collection of your thoughts and beliefs and experiences as you were growing up, and then it continues throughout your lifetime. Uh, so our money story really becomes our reality, and our reality really becomes kind of how we are with money. So I think collectively, one of the things I think that would be great is if women, if each of us say, you know what, we're gonna do this thing called retirement differently. We're gonna change this story. In 10 years, it's no longer gonna be we're in crisis. It's gonna be like, look how far women have come. That, and we're gonna talk to the next generation, maybe our nieces, um, you know, people we work with, our daughters, about how to be proactive around retirement and what are some of the unique situations we face and then giving them solutions earlier on so they're not in a position where they're behind the eight ball. And then I think collectively, our money story and the messages we hear around women in retirement will change. So that is my big lofty uh, hope for the future. But I think each and every one of us uh, can work to change our own money story by taking some of the um, steps we mentioned today. And Melissa, you've said a couple of times that you're optimistic. What what is what are you most optimistic about as we head out of this conversation? Yeah, that I think it can change. I mean, you can focus on all the, the negative things, the worries, the concerns that we have, but that you know, there's in, what's incredible is that when we look at kind of post pandemic, I mean, women are a financial economic force in the world. And there are more women returning to the workforce now. Uh, there, you know, for white women and black women, we're, we've reached a levels that are equal to uh, pre pandemic. And for Hispanic women who were hit even harder during the pandemic, they have actually exceeded their levels of work. We're seeing growth in wages for women, um, especially in some of the compet in, in some of the competitive areas. And so the trends, you know, feel good that we're heading in the right direction. And I think conversations like this help to educate more people and give 
hopefully give women more confidence that they can do things that, to Kathleen's point that the story isn't necessarily written that you can change your plot line you can mm -hmm. even if you know you were raised a certain way or you had a certain experience with money you can influence that you can you can make a better future and that it's not too late like i th i think women we're living a lot longer than probably most of us can expect and so you there is time um, to do something different a hundred percent where can people go to find more information about both of you? I will I will certainly be sending people to the um, website of the Alliance for more information about this conversation. But um, Kathleen, if, if people want more? Just go to breakingmoneysilence.com. It's my website and my podcast is there and a bunch of the information about um, financial psychology. And Melissa, for you? Um, both on LinkedIn or through Prudential. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you both for, for your time. Thanks for a great conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. And if you'd like more information, please head to our website at protectedincome.org. Thanks very much for being here. We'll see you next time.